In this video we're going to touch on a number of topics and the purpose is to reinforce points made in previous videos. You may recall this device, the Stratus 2S, which is featured in a number of my videos. It is a portable GPS, attitude heading reference system and ADS-B receiver. While I was in the USA in March, I upgraded to this model, which is the Garmin GDL50. It essentially has the same features, but what I especially like about it is the quality of the GPS log. And you can import that log into Google Earth and see very accurately the flight path flown by the aircraft. And here is the GPS track log from the Garmin unit imported into Google Earth. As you can see, it shows a very nice three-dimensional flight path. Here we are coming in from the northeast, across the hills and manoeuvring for the instrument approach, making the final turn and then down the instrument landing system. We taxied to our parking area, refueled, and then the track log shows our subsequent departure. From Hawaii, we flew down to Numea. Let's take a look at that approach in more detail. What you see on the left hand side of the screen is the Jeppesen instrument approach chart for runway 11 ILS Victor at Numea, New Caledonia. You can see that the approach starts overhead the Numea VOR, it tracks outbound to this beacon, makes a left turn for one minute, followed by a right turn to pick up the instrument landing system. And coming in from the northeast, that is precisely what we did during the actual approach. So just a quick lesson in reading pilots instrument approach charts as these are used by instrument rated pilots all around the world. There's a lot of information here but I'll just cover the main points. Firstly, the name of the airport and the runway for which the chart has been designed. The category of aircraft, category C and D, and that is dependent upon the landing speed of the aircraft. The Global Express iFly is a category C aircraft. We have the frequencies for the approach and tower and ground controllers, the localizer frequency, the final approach course, and here is a box showing the decision altitude. Now, the decision altitude is the lowest altitude we can fly before we must see the runway to continue any lower. That is why it is called the decision altitude. That is where we decide to continue or to carry out a missed approach. If we cannot see the ground at that point, we must carry out the missed approach, which is published here. This box shows the lowest safe altitudes within 25 nautical miles of the airport in the various directions. We then have a depiction of the approach itself in plan view and also in profile. To fly this approach, you come in over the Tontuta VOR, you then track outbound 285 degrees to the NDB here, November Whiskey, at which point you make a left turn to 236 degrees and fly for one minute, followed by a right hand turn to pick up the instrument landing system radio beam. Now an aircraft that is category D may actually have a radius like that. The category C Global Express will have a smaller radius and therefore we have a straight segment required to pick up that beam. You can see it's three dimensional. You must come in over the VOR initially, not lower than 6,000 feet, not lower than 2,700 feet at November Whiskey. Your procedure turn must be not lower than 2,600 feet and once you're on the instrument landing system beam, you can fly down to the decision altitude. If you're visual at that point, continue down to the runway. The decision altitude for a Category C aircraft is 320 feet on the altimeter, which is 291 feet above the ground. So looking at the GPS track log, you can see that the turn radius here was tighter for the Category C aircraft, and that means we had a straight segment before picking up the final approach direction down the ILS. 
if we take a look at this approach from an angle, you can see the three-dimensional component to it. Coming in from the northeast, we were clearing the hills. We flew over the airport. We tracked outbound 285 to the November Whiskey NDB. We made the left hand turn for one minute, followed by the right hand turn, and then we picked up the instrument landing beam for the final approach. And there we can see all the way down to the runway, followed by a short taxi, and after the refuel, we taxied out again for the departure. So the GPS log shows the departure as well, which is this part. Now the point I'd like to make here was covered in a previous video where we talked about the design of the various instrument approaches and how they must factor in the curvature of the Earth. Here you can see, during the cruise, the aircraft is very clearly following the curvature of the Earth. It is maintaining the same altitude above the ocean and by doing that it is following the curvature. You can see where we commenced our descent and because this part of the descent was based on altitude versus distance, the actual descent path itself has a curve. Where that changes is when we start referencing a ground beacon because the radio beam coming from the runway is a straight line. So this part of the approach is a straight line. It is no longer curved. Whereas the initial part of the approach here is a curve. So here's another view that shows this point clearly. The part of the descent based on altitude versus distance has a curve. Whereas the part of the final approach where we are flying a radio beam has no curve because that radio beam is a straight line in space. And I'll link to this video in the description below. It's a previous one where I showed the FAA documents actually confirm that the curvature of the Earth is factored in to the design of these instrument approaches. It's irrefutable that they have to factor in the curvature to define the precise final approach fix and the GPS track log certainly backs that up. So in the next part of the video, we're going to look at the attitude and heading reference system of the Garmin GDL50, because the way it operates, the way it calibrates, and the way it self-corrects any errors completely debunks the flat earth claims about gyros in aircraft. I have a series of videos using a real artificial horizon where I actually open it up and show the mechanism correcting in real time and also in time lapse. I'll link to these videos in the description below also. This one here shows multiple self-corrections where I deliberately induce errors in the instrument and just let it correct in a time lapse. You'll see that every time the instrument is upset, it will find its level automatically. And it does that with the pendulous veins in the mechanical gyro. This ability allows it to fly just fine around the curvature of the Earth and always remain level to the local horizontal. The Flat Earthers claim that these instruments are calibrated before takeoff and they then remain rigid in space. Nothing could be further from the truth. They require the correction mechanism to function properly. So here is my actual unit connected to two iPads. One is running ForeFlight and the other one is running Garmin Pilot. But as you can see, both of the apps are giving us accurate attitude information when I move the GDL50. If the aircraft pitches down, we get that sort of indication. If the aircraft pitches up, we have this type of indication. And as long as we move at rates typical of what we would find in an aircraft, the Garmin unit has no trouble showing us an accurate attitude.
But what happens if we just shake it too fast, much faster than an aircraft would actually maneuver? It's going to lose its orientation. And there you can see with the unit back level on the table, both apps are showing incorrect attitude information, but they are correcting. And now how do they know what direction to correct to? And the Garmin Pilot app even puts up the word degraded, telling us that it is no longer reliable until the unit self-corrects. So we're good again. Now I'm going to throw it around a bit more and this time I'm going to put the unit upside down. And let's see if it aligns itself correctly with the unit upside down. As you can see, it has gone into correction mode. It is even telling us that the AHAS is aligning and it's dropped off for flight momentarily. What the unit is doing is sensing the direction of down. If I drop something, it's going to fall in the direction of down. This unit is sensing that direction. So even though the unit is upside down, it still knows which way is up. Now that we have an accurate indication, if I slowly put this back to the upright position, you can see the indications are correct. There's a slight error there, but it is also self-correcting. So it doesn't matter what attitude we put this unit, put it on its side, or like that. It is going to self-correct according to the sensed direction of down. There you can see, it is in the AHAS Align mode again. As soon as that degraded sign disappears, we know the unit is again reliable. So I'll put it back to level on the table. And there it is, correct. What I'm going to do this time, what I'm going to do this time is turn the unit off. It is now powered down. I'm going to turn the unit on its side and turn it on again. So it's powering up in an attitude that is not level. Now this will take a little longer. It has picked up a GPS signal. And it also needs to connect to the iPads. That blue light indicates it has connected. And once the alignment process is complete, we should get an accurate indication. Now this iPad may not have reconnected, so we'll just check that. see the AHAS is still aligning. 
it's not aligning to the case of the instrument it's aligning to the sensed direction of down and it's taking a bit longer because it expects the unit to be level and because it's not seeing that it needs to understand which way is actually up and down based on accelerometers within the unit it's still thinking about it And now the degraded indication has gone. So if we carefully put that back to level, we're going to have the correct indication. So as you can see, the unit was able to align itself accurately, even when it was not in the level attitude itself. Anytime we upset the orientation and throw the gyros out, it will be able to self-correct based on the sensed direction of down. And it is doing that constantly. So when we're flying over the earth at 450 knots, we are only flying over one degree of curvature every eight minutes. Look how fast this is correcting errors. Much faster than that. So flying, even in a jet aircraft at 450 knots, the rate of correction required by this unit is so tiny, it can do it easily. So one thing I have noticed based on comments on previous videos is that the majority of the audience understands very easily what I am demonstrating. It is always just the flat earthers who never seem to understand. They miss the point completely and their comments clearly show that. Now this demonstration with the Garmin GDL50 and also my previous demonstrations with a real artificial horizon prove that they are capable of self-correcting. That ability to self-correct means they can fly perfectly fine over a curved earth, correcting at the rate of just one degree every eight minutes at 450 knots. The mechanical artificial horizon and the electronic AHARS can easily compensate at much faster rates and therefore they have no trouble at all giving correct indications flying around a curved earth. Now if you're a flat earther and you don't understand this video you have two options. You can remain silent and nobody will know that you don't understand or you can come to my channel and you can make comments showing everybody that you don't understand what you just watched. It is your choice entirely.